Rev up that arachnophobia and re-uploads because today we've got one that causes me great internal pain to even cover. As I've said before in the immortalized words of Damon Baird, it's because we are hardwired to react to things that skitter, and if this doesn't activate your almonds, I don't really know what will. Way back in 2002, as a young boy, I decided I would traumatize myself with today's movie, Eight-Legged Freaks. In a small mining town in Arizona, life is pretty quiet, with the town basically being bought out by a company as they want to store nuclear waste there within the barren mines, a trans Port goes awry, causing the local arachnids in a farm to become so large that they are able to hunt down humans. And luckily for everyone involved, this farm had multiple variants. So in today's episode, we'll be talking about what caused them to grow, how they were capable of it, and likely the impossibilities of this due to biological constraints. But first, this episode is sponsored by myself! That's right, I'm shilling out for Ono Gaming. But basically, I want to tell you guys, I actually do have merchandise now, like t-shirts, hoodies, and long sleeves. I haven't really figured out how to turn the painting I got from my friend into like a poster, but if you guys are interested in that, the link's in the description. All proceeds go towards paying her for the painting and to help keep this channel up and operational. All right, let's get back to it. So as per usual, up on screen, you'll see a timestamp. If you want to bypass the summary of this movie, you can head there and into the science of the arachnid growth. But for everyone else, before we get into my quip about the summary, I commend you for watching this on Friday because most certainly this freaking thing will have to be re-uploaded on Monday because copyright is an absolute nightmare status right now, even if it's transformative and protected by United States copyright copyright law. So inevitably, once it is and I stop complaining about it, I'll see you guys again on Monday. So back to my summary quip, let's get into why if this ever were to happen, I would probably just die of a heart attack first before like any spider ever got me. So we open up our story on Freedom Radio with Three Dog, a bit of a conspiracy theorist. I bet it would at least make for some pretty interesting broadcasts. Being out in the Arizona in this area, odds are transmissions aren't really as plentiful as they are in other places. It is the early morning, just before the sun rises, as a man transporting some form of chemical is driving down the road listening. As a rabbit runs out into the road, he sees it at the last second and then hits the guardrail trying to avoid it. I mean, PETA's gonna probably downvote this video, but just don't try to avoid animals in the road. You're just gonna hurt yourself. As he does, one of the barrels lands in the water and breaks open. Three days later, a man named Joshua is collecting crickets from around the small oasis for his spiders. Inspecting them, he's apparently doing so, presumably for the last three days, as they have been appearing all over. We then pan over to a shot to a kid riding his bike to the spider farm. And I have to stop and ask, why would any kid ever want to see spiders. I mean, I know there's kids like who collect bugs, but my god. Anyways, phobia aside, he heads into the spider farm where at first he can't find the owner. Looking around, he eventually spots a jumping spider. Appearing a little larger than normal, he goes to get a good look at it as it jumps into the glass, startling him and sending him running back into the owner. As they talk about spiders, Joshua then informs Mike that the spiders are growing larger and the crickets are like steroids for them. Although he does admit he's not entirely sure why it's the case. As he shows Mike around, he was able to procure a certain spider from South America. The males will bring the larger female gifts and she will inject the insects with acid that liquefies their guts and whoever brings the largest wins mating rights. So this will obviously be important later. After Mike Mike leaves, Joshua tells Mike that they will probably be twice as big next week. After he finally does exit the spider farm, Joshua then discovers that one of the spiders is really missing from his cage, having crawled out of there while they were talking. As he goes to look for it, the spiders begin launching their Iraq attack. He is bitten in the neck, which causes him to run into other containers of spiders, freeing them in the process. Him and his parrot then get got, and we now fast forward to a week later. Chris McCormick is riding back into his hometown on a bus. Being the son of the original mine's owner, he has come back to see if he can get it restarted to save the town. Coming back 10 years later, nobody has seen him in a very long time, so they have pretty much completely forgotten what he looks like, but it's a fairly warm reception of his homecoming. By the way, uh, if you want to know how this man ages in 10 years, this movie was 19 years ago, go ahead and Google the actor. The endless march of time is just a complete chotch. Anyhow, as Mike bikes back to the spider farm, which if you don't know, bike is short for bikel, he runs into the sheriff and deputy pulling a barrel out of the water. Samantha is Mike's hot mom, and also the sheriff of the town. She states that the water is contaminated and that they will send a sample to the EPA to figure out what exactly it is. Mike gets on his bike to warn Joshua about the contamination, but she grounds him for visiting a spider farm. I mean, if I were a parent, I would have to do the same thing. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I love science, but God help me, the skittering. But all right, look, that's my last reference to not liking spiders. I think you guys get it by now. Of course, spoiler alert, uh, this is also me in the future now, and I wrote this in the past. It will not be my last reference. We now jump over to the cool guys on dirt bikes as Samantha is giving her son a 
ride home, she passes the dirt bikers pulling off a wheelie. She pulls them over and gives them a ticket, and now we meet 2002 Scarlett Johansson, or Ashley. It took me several minutes for some reason to remember why she looks so familiar. Obviously, though, Samantha's pretty upset at the dirt bikers for endangering her daughter, so she gives them a ticket, tells her to get in the car, and then they all head home. Later that night, Mike attempts to call Joshua to warn him about the contaminated water, but as we see, the spiders have become much larger and have desiccated Joshua, pulling his beef jerky suit off to a horrible fate. Meanwhile, across town, there is a meeting at the mall over the selling of people's property. A company wants to use the old mines to store toxic and nuclear waste. However, they need all the property, not just some, as it could leach up from the ground and make people sick. They don't know if they should sell, though, as the owner of the mine originally said that there were still veins of gold there that could be mined out. The Mayor Wade responds by saying it's just simply not true. They need to sell while the offer is still there. Chris McCormick now shows up and protests the selling. He states that he's not selling the mines as it still has some life left in it. And, I mean, he's absolutely right. It definitely has life left in it. As Wade goes outside to talk to him, Wade begins egging him on until eventually Chris punches him in the face, which is now where we figure out that Samantha and Chris had a thing going on. Wade says he wants to press charges, but Samantha basically just sends him home and says, no, you can't do that. And Ashley accuses her mom of staring at Chris's butt. You know, the normal things you say to your parents. Even further into the night, the deputy heads home. As he's working on remodeling his home in the middle of the night, his cat spots something entering the wall of that home. As his wife comes down and tells him it's time to go to bed, they realize the cat is in the wall. As they try to coax it out with some food, the cat is attacked and is also attacking something else, as made evident by the indentions in said wall. Eventually, however, both are fried by the overhead light electrical wires, but the spider survives. As usual, it's a movie, so we also need to have, like, rekindled love. Duh. So we get some backstory on Sam and Chris. Chris apparently beat up her husband 10 years ago and broke his nose and then left town without telling Sam why. Gladys tells him to stop being a punk about it and basically just go over there and talk to her, which rustles his jimmies just enough so that he actually does it. Over at Sam's house, the deputy calls her the next morning to say that something ate his cat, but he has no idea what it was. Meanwhile, Mike is trying to sneak out of the house, but finds that his bike has been chained up. The deputy's wife leaves him over the cat being eaten, which, I mean, man, that's a strong marriage. <laughs> like, I get it. I mean, I would be upset if somebody ate Mrs. Kitty, but I probably wouldn't, you know, leave my wife over it. Anyhow, Chris shows up to talk to Sam as Ashley believes it is her boyfriend coming to pick her up. All right, so uh, here they have this, like, conversation in the kitchen, and Ashley is kind of an ass. I mean, it actually reminds me of an Ashley that I used to date, but she insults her mom for getting pregnant at 16 and literally creating Ashley, which is a bold strategy. But the mom gives her a taser as she heads out towards the door. Also, why is it the kid gets grounded for going to a spider farm, but the daughter acts like a complete douche canoe and still gets out and gets to go do whatever she wants to do? I mean, we truly do live in a society. So after finally answering the door, we get the statement I would make too. Hey, I was wondering if your mom was home. Chris apologizes for punching Wade yesterday and then asks Samantha if they would like to get together while he's back in town. And then he just kind of walks away and doesn't make a date. What a Chad. But this gave Mike the chance to sneak away while they were talking. As Mike goes back to the spider farm, he finds it covered in webs everywhere, like way more than normal. Exiting the back of the farm, he finds Joshua's boot outside and also a pathway into the mines. Entering the mine itself, he finds a piece of exoskeleton and then looking up, he sees in the distance a giant spider walking towards him. So he does what every normal person would do and nope the hell out of there. In another part of the mine, Chris meets up with a group of miners, as in like they're mining for a living and not the age type of miners. And then he ends up coming across Mike when he heads back into town. Mike shows him the exoskeleton he found and to which Chris says it's a little big to be a spider -like. Back in the mine, however, things are going sideways. And I just want to point out, Chris told them to wear their masks because the mine actually has a lot of methane gas, but they're like just kind of wearing a piece of cloth over their face. It's not going to work. Anyways, as one of the miners goes to clear the line, he ends up getting a ton of spiders in his mouth for being attacked by a larger spider. Getting back home, Mike ends up getting caught by his mom at this point, and I have to think that like he's been grounded for three years. I don't think it's working. Over at Wade's house, we see an Austin get got by something, and this alerts Wade that something might be out there. He heads outside to walk amongst the weird birds with men legs and to find out what's startling them. As he walks by, we see the ground is moving. He then finds a pair of weird man legs with no bird attached. As he continues to stay out there, a bunch more ostriches around him start getting grabbed by trapdoor spiders. The next morning, Leon is discussing the missing pets all over town, and he thinks it's aliens, but in reality, it's way worse. So we now jump over to the young couple, Ashley and Brent. Basically, Brent is pushing for and Ashley's like, no. And if I ever hear any of you nerds use the phrase, you bring out the beast in me, I mean, catching a taser to the testicles is pretty much well-deserved at that point because it's so lame. Anyways, though, this kind of pisses her off, so she takes off with Brent's truck, and he sees a giant spider on the hillside as he gets up off the ground. He runs over to his buddies as an 
rack attack commences. Most of them get grabbed immediately, but a few are able to make it onto their bikes to begin the chase. As the chase drags out, every one of them, except for Brent, gets grabbed. Eventually, the chase makes it out onto the road where a tanker truck is crashed and then blown up. In the process, this took out the town's telephone lines so that they can no longer call for help. Some of the jumping spiders actually do survive this and continue to give chase. Brent is able to eventually make it to one of the mines and causes a cave-in, saving himself from becoming spider food. Back at Gladys's house, her dog heads to the basement and finds a hole in the wall. A spider exits and then grabs the dog. As Gladys goes in to investigate, she finds the dog's collar and then enters the hole in the wall herself, probably something you shouldn't do. Chris comes back to the house and also enters the hole in the basement wall to find a giant spider leg. He grabs it and then heads to Samantha's house. Going up to Mike, he shows him the spider leg and apparently this kid has like an algorithm for spiders. He adds in the new information and finds that the spiders are much larger than previously thought. Mike mentions how there was web around and it seems like, according to Mike, she may have been attacked by a male weaver. Meanwhile, in Ashley's room, a male does show up. Encasing her in web, Chris is able to fight it off with a chair while Samantha goes to get a force multiplier. She's able to take it out before they all get got. Sam calls the deputy at this point to tell him to get all the force multipliers and meet up at her house. Back down at the mines, Brent sees firsthand that people are getting injected with acid into them and then taken out. The town at this point is officially under attack as night falls. The barber shop, one of the barbers gets attacked in web and the deputy then starts getting followed by a jumping spider and in general, it's all going to crap. Mike says that the spiders are almost always nocturnal hunters and they're coming out of the mines to feed. He has has an idea to use the radio station to get the news out to everyone since the phones are down. Heading into Leon's trailer, and I know we're jumping around a lot, but that's just the name of the game with this movie, Samantha begins broadcasting that giant spiders are attacking. Even the conspiracy theorist at this point doesn't really believe her. And speaking of giant spiders, the largest tarantula, known as Tank, shows up to attack the trailer, having followed them by noise and vibrations. Making their escape, they head into town as everyone all over is being attacked by giant spiders. As everyone runs to their car, they start getting got by trapdoor spiders, which is horrifying. And then we flash over to the mall. Wade is eating an ostrich burger, which I'm actually not going to lie, that sounds absolutely delicious, especially because I haven't eaten lunch yet. Samantha gets on the loudspeaker of her police cruiser as she drives along to tell everyone who's capable to head towards the mall. As Wade looks on, considering it's the mall that he built, people begin running in. Although there's quite a few people running in, he asks what's going on and then sees the entire town being racked. Also, there's like this one part, uh, <laughs> it's like this one part where this dude is like running in and then like the spider starts punching them and it has like the punch sound effects. I don't know if Matt can add that in with the actual sound, but Matt, if you can, just put that right here. Anyways, I have no idea why, but this just made me laugh like you would not believe. Anyways, they're able to get the word shut in time and then meet up to talk about what's happening. Mike mentions how they have to be quiet or else the spiders will hear them. So everyone needs to keep it down and be, you know, as quiet as possible. With no phones to call for help, they turn to cell phones. But remember, this was 2002. I'm about to sound like a boomer, but dude, like back in 2002, I mean, it was better than like the 90s, but, uh, you know, you could just drop signal for literally no reason. It didn't have near the capabilities we have like even in 19 short years now, as there's been like a ton of advancement. Anyways, the town begins arming themselves with anything they can fight with as Leon and Chris head up to the roof to try to boost the signal of the one cell phone they do have. As they head up, they see the largest spider trying to break into the gate, which shows a fair amount of intelligence being used by them. Wade, being the hero he is, slips out the back room and then locks the door behind him. Meanwhile, Leon and Chris are being attacked as the spiders have found them on the roof. As he makes a call for help, he starts screaming that they're here, which isn't historically how you want to get people to listen to you as 911 hangs up. As they gather at the door for the inevitable spider breach, the largest spider breaks through releasing hundreds of smaller ones to begin their attack on everyone in the mall. This fairly quickly scatters everyone as some choose to run, hide, and others choose to fight. The deputy and Samantha get separated and eventually they find the door that Wade locked like a total turd. The deputy is able to get behind a gate before he gets attacked which ends up saving him. On the roof, Chris uses the line, stay back you eight-legged freaks, which oh he said it, and Leon runs through the spider group to lure them away. He jumps off the roof, but aims for the bushes, and then meets up with the deputy. Chris uses a cable line to get away and ends up in the air duct system of the mall. Back in the mine, Brent runs into Wade. Getting on the bike, Wade then gets grabbed and dragged away by the spiders as Brent takes back off with his bike. Apple doesn't fall too far from the tree, does it? Anyways, Samantha now meets back up with Chris and gets him out of the air vent. So back to those that hid. Spiders are also 
hiding now too. The barber gets got by one using a tent as cover, and he really just should have stayed in that small room. With the rest of the group, Samantha pins a forklift to the door to keep out one of the larger spiders, but you know that's probably not going to work. As they go into the mines, Ashley runs into Brent again, but they now have to contend with the methane gas. Chris tells them that the slightest spark will ignite the whole place and blow them all up, so force multipliers have been officially taken off the table now. Time to switch to force enhancers. As the group gets attacked by two spiders, they end up taking it out with a crossbow, and then start finding that a lot of the town has been captured, and some of them are alive, most are just completely desiccated. But going through there isn't necessarily the greatest of experiences. They end up finding Wade and releasing him from the webs, and while this is happening, the tarantula pushes the forklift back and ends up letting in all the smaller spiders. Chris is now going to go find Gladys, as Chris and Samantha agree they love each other, you know, as you do. Chris goes to look for her, eventually he does end up finding her alive. And it just so happens, just behind him is a giant vein of gold. As he looks at the gold, the female giant spider shows up and he ends up spraying it with either like mouth spray or perfume and then takes off with the bike and Gladys. Stopping, he puts the matches in the broken light socket and the rest of the group gets to the generator. As the spiders continue to give chase a literal nightmare, they get the generator working that this then ignites the matches, which ignites the methane and deep fries the spiders just as the Lord intended to be done to them. All over town and the mall and likely people houses, the explosion backtracks and annihilates all the spiders. So finally, the surrounding town cops and emergency personnel show up as they were listening to Leon's broadcast and decide that maybe the town wasn't joking and might need help. The deputy says that the spiders got gigantic because of toxic waste as he was covered in the stuff and now his hairline is advancing once more with new growth. And according to Leon, they never did reopen the mine. But then how did he get the gold teeth? Who knows? That's the fun. So the first place we should obviously start to get it out of the way, biologically speaking, is the impossibility. Ready to learn more about spiders than you ever really wanted to? Apart from maybe like the best way to get them out of your house? Well, there is a reason that bugs in general, and I can't say insect because someone will comment, you're arachnid, gee, growing oak, but they aren't really that large of a creature. And the issue comes down to the ability to properly saturate organs and tissue with oxygen. Way back in the day, when life was just getting started on land, bugs were kind of a big deal. The oxygen on the planet was much higher at roughly 30% compared to our 21% in the current day and age. This was essentially the golden era for insects, arachnids, and pretty much anything that had an exoskeleton. Running around, they would eat reptiles for breakfast, and the planet was a pretty horrifying place with centipedes that would grow roughly about six feet long or about two meters. To quote a famous marine, if the covenant wanted to wipe out this particular era of Earth's history, that's fine by me. But this oxygen content in the air would ultimately spell the shrinking of the bug's influence. The problem with high oxygen content is there's more fires. Through a combination of events, over time the oxygen levels in the atmosphere would begin to dip. While the bugs were larger, their bodies did not have to worry about the oxygen content as much in the air, so open circulatory systems were preferred, which essentially comes down to a very simple heart pumping blood into body parts to sort of bathe the organs in that blood to saturate them with oxygen. As the oxygen continued to fall, however, the organs would get less and less oxygen, as well as the system would not be very efficient. And this would ultimately cause the bugs in general to shrink as they could not properly bathe these organs in oxygen-laden blood, which meant the biological constraints of a larger body would be too much for the simple system of transporting oxygen. Think of it, literal generations of bugs feeling like they can't catch their breath but still living. Not a great time. Anyhow, this ultimately resulted in smaller bugs as their bodies evolved and grew during a time when the oxygen content was higher. And knowing what we know about evolution, as long as they still pass on genes to maintain that primitive heart pump, as well as the open circulatory system, then that will continue to exist. So enter the spider. The spider also maintains this open circulatory system. The arachnid class is one that is quite variant in size with some so small that you can barely even see them and wouldn't even know if they were, say, attached to you right now as you were sitting here listening to me. Like you feel that on the back of your neck, right? But they can also be as nearly as large as a foot wide in length at least from foot to foot. And this spider is known as the Goliath Bird Eater, which eats as its name implies, but it can also pretty much eat anything smaller than it. Plus, I wouldn't be surprised if it would take a bite out of you as well. The point is, due to oxygen constraints on this planet during the current point in time, we don't have to worry about a Starship Troopers event taking place on Earth anytime soon, as the literal atmosphere keeps these creatures small because of their evolutionary path towards open circulatory systems. Now, the arguably better system, which I may be biased as I enjoy, is the 
the closed circulatory system. And this system forms blood vessels and a pulmonary system in order to sort of saturate blood effectively and then send it to tissues all over the body by a heart that is a part of that circulatory system. Holy cow, I'm saying system a lot. And the key is that this is able to allow for larger animals despite lower oxygen levels in the atmosphere as organs are properly saturated with O2. This is why we have animals like elephants roaming around and even animals as large as whales in the ocean. So let's take a moment to thank God that spiders kept their open circulatory systems. I could not imagine our ancestors having to spear a giant spider. We would have we would have been annihilated. But because of this concerning the movie, that's why it's basically a biological impossibility for spiders to grow to that size that they are under normal circumstances that is. But what we have seen sort of defies the normal circumstances of growth amongst arachnids. So how might it actually be able to work then? To understand how this might be a possibility, the first thing we must understand is what has triggered this rapid growth in the spiders. It's pretty obvious that the event that caused it, as we have seen, was the barrel of mystery substance that entered the water. Once leaking into its surrounding environment, the first creatures to come into contact with it, apart from maybe fish, appears to be crickets. With the toxic waste entering the bodies of the crickets, in all likelihood, this would have caused the crickets crickets to probably have grown as well given enough time. However, because they were snatched up by Joshua within a few days of their exposure, which he does remark on the size of them, meaning that they do appear to be growing, he immediately feeds them to the spiders. And I have to commend Joshua for his thoroughness though, as we literally see no other giant bugs. Regardless, upon entering the body of the spiders, it does take a while to affect them, but by three days later when Mike arrives, we are already seeing a change within the spiders that would indicate a few things are happening. The first is that their bodies are growing, meaning cellular mitosis is increasing. The second that we are seeing is that they are actually more intelligent than your average spiders, possibly even more intelligent than average animals in general, as they have been seen working together to take down Joshua as Tank the Tarantula launches the Iraq attack. So what might be triggering this? Well, the thing about toxic waste is, what is it? Is it nuclear and it does something to the genes by damaging them? Is it just chemical and it burns away cells or maybe enters the cells causing mutations in the DNA? Or is it just a bunch of old carpeting that contains the remnants of lead paint from the 80s? I mean, who's to say? But what Whatever was contained within this barrel is something that has specific effect on the spiders but does not damage their DNA. So I would propose that whatever the toxic waste is, is sort of irrelevant, but what it does is critically important. Once entering the body of the spider, it would appear to possibly mimic a chemical in our own bodies known as cyclin-dependent kinase 1 or CDK1. And I can hear you asking, what in the name of hell is CDK1? Well, CDK1 essentially flips the trigger on cells and tells them to divide. When this happens, an entire cascade of events begins unfolding to get the cell ready as centrosomes mature and ultimately DNA is copied as the cell then is pretty much split. But it would appear that it all starts here. With the waste mimicking this chemical messenger, the key is that it's not just doing this to organs, blood, or in the exoskeleton, but due to the way that spiders think and coordinate with one another, the idea is that it must be triggering this reaction to divide across the board. Now I can also hear you, Roanoke, neurons do not divide after differentiation because because they lack centrioles for division. And you are correct. Unless the toxic waste rewrote the genetic coding, then they you know, would not have dividing neurons. But for this idea to work, their DNA needs to remain untouched. So something has to be accounting for the increased intelligence. Now, just for your information though, just to kind of get back to neurons, because you know, this is kind of a science channel. The reason our neurons do not divide is because this would be absolutely heinous for us. Imagine you're sitting there with your family, career ahead of you, list of interests and friends, you know, all the good stuff. And oh, what? What's that? Your neurons decide it's time to divide? New connections, new ideas, new person, new you. Our social aspects would fall apart quickly. Ideas that you are working on would be lost. Old progress is just basically destroyed. Eventually the brain would become slower and slower and more cumbersome as neural tissue increased. And essentially our neurons dividing isn't necessarily the best thing in the world for our ability to think. So thankfully, neurons do not possess centrioles, so no dividing. But apart from that concerning spiders, they actually could use a little more neural mass. As they continue to grow in size, the normal mitotic pathways of the rest of the body would continue to push the spiders to grow in size. But critical areas like blood cells would increase as well, possibly serving the body with more oxygen. It's entirely possible that new organs could begin to grow, like extra hearts or maybe more lung and trachea tissue, which would also be used to breathe. The only way around the oxygen saturation problem would be to attempt to increase the oxygen carrying capacity of the body, as well as make it pumped around the body more efficiently, which may be done through the addition of extra pump 
pumping organs. With that said, I still believe, however, that they do have an open circulatory system. After taking a few hits from force multipliers, we do see that they have the same green hemolymph blood, and it appears to spew out the same basically no matter where they are hit from, indicating that their bodies are very much the same, just larger. As their bodies got larger, their brains did as well, and again, because neurons cannot divide, what was dividing them? Well, I believe that since the entire body was growing across the board, stem cells may have actually played a role in specifically the growth of the brain. As I have discussed previously in my Bioshock video, stem cells can differentiate into other variants of cells in the body as they contain all of the genetic information of the person apart from like say the sex cells because those undergo meiosis. What I would presume is happening is these stem cells are multiplying like the rest of the cells in the body as mitosis is sent into overdrive due to the chemical messenger. Because of the open body system, some would actually find their way into the neurons of the brain and then differentiate into neurons. They would be able to form dendritic connections inside of the spider brain, adding to the overall mass of the brain, allowing them to form more complex plans and think ahead, which is horrifying because spiders right now are actually perfectly capable of learning from situations and formulating ideas and how to do things differently, if you didn't know, but it is just specific spiders. Other spiders, it's kind of like running your head into a wall. But this spider intelligence would likely continue to increase as the spider grew, eventually reaching a point where possibly the brain may get too large, leading to a decrease in thinking capacity, but for the time being, they remain intelligent. One of the indicators of this intelligence is actually what they choose to do. The mines may seem like a normal place for a spider to hang out, but there are specific reasons as to why they would do this. As their bodies become larger, faster, they would need to molt more often and would require higher humidity to do so. Seeing as this is Arizona, I'm going to go ahead and take a guess that the humidity out there is probably not very high. As such, molting would be very difficult as they continue to grow. Seeking the shelter of the mines would offer them a more humid environment and protection from being discovered. I would still think that they are still kind of somewhat animalistic, probably eusocial species, but doing this would allow themselves time to grow effectively and would also indicate planning ahead or understanding consequences of molting improperly. Another mark of intellect is the hierarchy they formed rather quickly. With the jumping spiders being the scouts, the orb weavers taking prey to offer it to the matriarch Consuela, which is the giant spider's name, or even the giant tarantula named Tank, who's sent in to knock down barriers but is more respected than the other spiders. The fact is they form a structure like this and this would be an understanding of importance such as mating with the matriarch and an understanding of power and strengths such as with the tarantula. So I see really two possibilities. The first is that they have indeterminate growth meaning that they will continue to grow and grow and grow until they are literally crushed under their own weight. The second option is that they actually have reached a point where the chemical messenger to grow has cleared out of their bodies as they are no longer consuming the crickets leading to their growth and have instead turned to prey that is not tainted by chemical waste. And I would say it's the latter over the former. The reason for this is once heading down into the mines, the crickets would no longer really be something that they would notice nor crave. And eventually the chemical ingested to sheer body size would slow down or stop it considerably because there just would not be enough of this chemical. But also because of what Mike saw when he entered the cave system a few days later. We saw the spiders are still relatively the same size. And because of this, this may have actually been their new natural size brought on by the increased mitosis and beefing up of critical areas such as their ability to saturate organs with oxygen and their ability to think ahead and plan. So this means that their brain at this point is fairly intelligent and would not have grown anymore. So the spiders from eight-legged freaks are ones who technically speaking would need a complete overhaul structurally, at least internally, to change into what we see. More hearts, more oxygen carrying capacity, and more lungs and trachea tissue. Which if you didn't know, spiders actually breathe with their trachea as well. It doesn't just transfer air, they literally pick up oxygen. But if this hurdle could be overcome utilizing stem cells to bolster the brain to a certain size, this could potentially get them to the point of being maybe not sapient, but at least sentient. And they're able to work with one another like a eusocial species, much like with what we see with ants, except they're all different species, but of the same class working together. And a lot of this intelligence and newfound social ability can be heard at least when they make grunts at each other and they do actually in some capacity use body language to communicate. But to sum up, let's be all thankful that hundreds of millions of years separate us from giant insects and arachnids of the past because sweet Jesus, no.